Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Next slide. I'll edit that part out. It'll look great. Seebec uh, is uh, run by our board. Um, we have a few new folks um, we are hoping to add to the board, um, including uh, Bobby Thompson from Collins Warman, um, who uh, hopefully serves our sponsorship coordinator, um, and Kayla Salmon from 4EA, um, who will be our communications chair. Um, the rest of us are Amelia Davis from Northwest Partners is our secretary. Uh, Grace Wong is taking over a treasurer role. Amanda Pro is our education chair. If you have ideas for future presentations, please reach out to her. Cliff Marvin does membership. Hillary Roy does our venues, um, which we will get back to at our next meeting in September. Bill Thorderson with Bain is our student outreach. Um, Jeremy DeWitt manages the website. Penny Short is our board administrator. And Phil Martinson is our contact out in Spokane. Um, you should see or be able to access a poll here um, in your Zoom window. Um, it's our June meeting, and so we need to approve or reject this slate of, um, of board members. So if you could kindly approve the board, we would much appreciate it. Um, if anybody has any questions about CBEC's kind of operations, there is a link to our bylaws on um, the website. Oh, I did not object to this. This is this is the meeting we're in now. Um, our next meeting will be in September. Uh, the topic is to be decided. Uh, other local stuff going on. CSI Puget Sound is doing the specifications 101 class number four on July 13th. Um, and it looks like IBEC's next chapter meeting is October 13th. Um, and then they also have their Doug Jason golf tournament coming up on the 26th. Um, and I just saw um, a notice for the iCry golf tournament, um, which is also coming up soon. I should have put that in. Um, the CBEC research grant applications are now available. Um, we do a research grant of $2,000 to somebody working on furthering um, building science. And um, that is, uh, will be, applications are due December 2nd, I believe. And um, we'll be back um, with the award, I think in January. Um, we had a very successful first run with that. And we're looking forward to um, supporting some more uh, building science research. Uh, Todd Ketchum from Trespa is our sponsor, and uh, Bill Thordarson um, will tell us a little bit about Trespa. Thank you. Let me see if I can jump in. I always screw this up. Get my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, yeah, we're looking at the whole window, but we see everything. Yeah. Yes. Is that better? Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. So, um, <clears throat> so Trespa International um, is a um, company based out of the Netherlands. Um, my company, Bain Associates, we're product reps. We have about 20 lines, roofing and cladding lines. Um, one of them is Trespa, um, based out of the Netherlands. Um, started in 1960 um, and just kind of has developed since then they do a ton of, um, they make everything out of it in Europe, furniture, cabinetry, you know, a bunch of stuff. So um, what it is, is it's a high pressure laminate um, and it's basically just made in a sheet form. Um, just a little bit of the history. So you kind of get an idea what, um, um, <clears throat> when they started and what, what they've developed since then. The big thing was when they developed a electronic beam curing and if you're in the, the laminate industry, you probably know what that is, but basically it's just another level of when they put the final color decor on um, and, and it gets um, shot with electrons and um, it just gives it a higher level of uh, durability in terms of um, UV stability. And then also 
scratch resistance and it helps with graffiti. Um, excuse me, going all the way. And then just some uh, milestones along the way. Um, they, you know, initially for a while, Trespa would, they would want to do control everything and, and you would send them a set of plans and they would send you kind of a kit of parts back for your, for your building facade. Um, ever since I've been with my company, we've kind of gone a different route with that um, in terms of being able to have uh, fabricator partners and um, local distribution. So there's um, getting into the nuts and bolts of it. So there's two kinds of, um, if you're not familiar with Trust at all um, products. So basically what it is, is it's a, um, let's see if I can get the one slide. No, it's not on there. Um, it's high pressure laminate. So it's craft paper um, combined with a phenolic resin layered and then um, a final paper decor um, of the different colors is all put in and it um, goes into a big oven on a press pack and gets um, pressed and heated and um, you know for about 45 minutes and then it comes out. Um, the end result is a super stable, um, long lasting, um, high strength panel that you can basically design anything you want with. So different, you know, four different sheet sizes, three different thicknesses. Um, the reason you would switch thicknesses is just if you were going to do a concealed fastener system versus a um, exposed fastener system. Um, so just to kind of give you a couple ideas. So on the left would be more of what we would call the Medion uh, facade panels, um, the larger ones where they're basically coming in um, gigantic sheet sizes all the way up to seven foot by 14 foot. And then more recently, um, we developed a plank system. So it's about a seven inch by 10 foot plank that is um, manufactured at the plant in the Netherlands and then shipped over in, in, in a pack of four. It kind of stops at four just based on the weight, um, a weight thing for how, what, you know, Ocean wants to see people lifting. The beauty of that product is it's basically we can, we can make it and store it and distribute it and have it ready to go locally versus if you pick, you know, and it's limited in colors, but at the same time, um, you know, we kind of pick the popular color so it usually fits the need. But um, having said that, if you wanted to pick a different color, um, let me just get to the color chart. So tons of different colors. Um, hundred and some different colors and they, they've kind of developed them and, and they've gotten rid of some and they've added some over the years. Um, and then in terms of textures, um, there's basically kind of anything from a smooth to a matte rock to a matte oblique where they kind of combine satin and matte finish. And then there's a rock texture. Um, so again, UV stability, super strong, color stability, super strong. And just kind of scroll through a few projects here so you know if you're driving around and you see it. So Seahawks training facility been there for a long time. All this brown wooden paneling that you see. Um, really cool project in, in eastern Washington um, where you can kind of see the modeling in different colors of the panel. A lot of um, brand identity. So, you know, groups like these will use the, the product over and over again. They can rely on the same colors. Um, great soffit product um, in terms of just being able to be exposed to the elements. Um, this is a really cool project down in Atlanta. These are just like two different colors of metallic panels, but they flip them around. Every time you turn it 90 degrees, it's a different shade of that color. So, um, so large, large projects, small projects, you know, different colors. Um, this is kind of our, um, um, the one that tells the, the, the story so much is um, this project's about 20, 25 years old up in Everett and all this, you know, from soffit to all the way up the wall, um, it's still, um, still uh, performing remarkably. So anyway, thanks for your time. I will um, turn it back over. And if you have any questions, I'll type my email address into the notes. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Um, was that the black building was just all different textures of the same special panel? Yeah. Um, yeah, if, if it's 
depending on the on the final coating, if it's a metallic or a, a what we call the specular, where it's kind of a model between gloss and and, and matte finish. Um, yeah, every time you turn the panel one direction, it, it just kind of gives a different color, which is great unless you don't try and do it. Then then it kind of you got to be careful. So. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Bill. You bet. Uh, so, um, as you may have noticed, uh, this is set up as a webinar, um, which means that attendees are muted throughout the presentation while panelists can share their video and share their screens. Um, we'd like you to use the Q&A function um, in your Zoom window to ask questions. Um, and if Patricia is okay with that, I will um, ask those questions uh, throughout the meeting as they come up, if I can interject them. Um, and yeah, that's the kind of the basics of it. If we have time at the end, we'll um, maybe try and open it up for folks to, to just chat. Um, our topic tonight is environmental facade perspective, designing a sustainable rain screen wall assembly, aspiration versus actualization, which is a mouthful, but it's a big paper. Uh, it's presented by Patricia Straw, who is a facade specialist um, here in Seattle's uh, Morrison, I guess it's Morrison Hirschfield Seattle office. Um, so she works on some of our facade engineering and advanced facade design work. Uh, Patricia, you are welcome to take it over from here. All right. Oh, seeing your notes. We got it now. <laughs> That's the one. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Again, my name is Patricia Shaw. Um, so the presentation that I am actually going through today um, was a, is an adaptation for um, my dissertation research that I did um, for my Master of Science in Facade Engineering from the University of the West of England. Um, so get started. Uh, so the biggest thing is that building facades are, you know, this aesthetic expression of a building's purpose. However, the envelope also provides regulatory functions such as thermal control against the environmental impacts on the building system, thereby protecting the indoor environment of buildings. Unfortunately, design and detailing of facades have received much less attention than the building structure itself. So the methods and principles of facade construction are not evolving well enough to balance the elevated environmental expectations. Consequently, facade assemblies such as rain screen opaque wall assemblies continue to suffer repetitive failures, which the construction industry should presently be capable of avoiding. Institutionally, some of these lessons learned from major failures and collapses have been incorporated into our codes and standards over the years. But even then, the origin of the lesson and the context of the problems are often lost, making it difficult to apply the lesson to future situations. Um, this is often due to the fact that our construction industry tends to decline any opportunity for making public knowledge of facade failures. Although that's understandable, in our current protectionist culture, this approach to facade failures is nurturing an industry which does not learn from mistakes. Nevertheless, with proper guidance and progressive construction principles, the construction industry is still capable of making progress towards the reduction of facade failures. Sustainable construction principles are leading design teams and building component manufacturers to evaluate the implementation methods utilized within the industry with a critical eye. Already improvements can be seen in construction quality all around the world due to the more vigorous steps required to meet various sustainable certification pro programs, such as LEED. Uh, my research explored the disconnect between the aspirational su sustainable design and construction principles and then the implementation measures of constructing those rain screen facades. So 
Previous research has been completed considering the shortcomings of the building design and construction process. However, minimal research has addressed the impact of sustainable principles specifically on the process itself. So my research aimed to highlight some of the areas of rain screen facade implementation, which are being enhanced due to the move towards sustainable buildings, um, as well as draw to attention, draw attention to the areas of rain screen facade industry which are not being fully impacted. Um, so as I developed my dissertation, my aims and objectives uh, were to evaluate the relevant building and energy codes um, requirements of facades in relation to sustainable design and construction, establish the current sustainable construction principles which relate to facade design and implementation, evaluate the ways in which sustainable construction principles impact the design of facades, evaluate the ways in which sustainable construction principles impact the implementation and installation of facades, establish the main methods in which facades fail due to design, also establish the main methods in which facades fail due to implementation, analyze the impact of sustainable construction principles on the installation of facade systems, and then extrapolate improvements which could be made to sustainable design and construction principles to better the actualization of sustainable rain screen facades. So that is, those were my aims and objectives as I got started and got going into this. Um, so the first step in my research was looking at um, the building and energy model codes. So I looked at um, the International Building Code, the IBC, the International Energy Conservation Code, so IECC, ASHRAE Standard 90.1, the International Green Construction Code, and then I also looked at LEED. Um, I also looked at BREAM and a few other programs um, in reference, um, but those listed here were the main ones that I looked at. Um, building and energy codes provide the minimum performance requirements for constructing new buildings and renovating or restoring existing buildings. There are two private organizations which develop model energy codes that define the achievable levels of energy efficiency. That is the International Code Council, ICC, and the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, ASHRAE. So although both of these organization, organizations are grounded in the U.S., their model codes are actually influence, influential um, throughout the world. Um, we there is a global membership, and so they are recognized and adapted worldwide. The ICC was founded in 1994, um, and they became one of the leading global source, sources of model codes and standards. Um, and then we had ASHRAE, which was founded in 1894 um, as a global society advancing human well-being through sustainable technology for the built environment. So every three years, as advancements in technologies are made in order to promote re more resilient buildings, which address challenges such as natural disasters and the global climate, climate crisis, both of these pro um, communities will release their different um, model codes. They do it on a uh, different cycle though. So they're not producing the same um, model codes, they're going to be slightly different every every time it's released. Um, but the good thing is they're both, uh, both the ICC and ASHRAE allow any interested party to participate in development processes by submitting proposals to change the code and commenting on others' proposals. So that way, these codes provide some of the most uh, pertinent regulations and guidelines for sustainable facade design and construction throughout the world. So one of the important things to look at is how the IECC and ASHRAE standard 90.1 work and what kind of things that I could pull out um, that were in relate, relation to um, the, the energy performance and the performance, sustainable performance of uh, facade assemblies. And so both codes have a similar structure. One, um, and so they both have two paths that you can um, get compliance from. So you either do the prescriptive path or you can do the total building performance path. So the building envelope prescriptive path requires facade assemblies to meet a minimum thermal performance through either the insulation component R value based method, the UCF and F factor based method, the fenestration U factor and solar heat gain coefficient requirements or the component performance alternative method. 
the total building performance path allows compliance of the building envelope as one component of the whole building energy efficiency. In this compliance path, heating systems, cooling systems, service water heating, fan systems, lighting power, receptacle loads, and process loads are all taken into account along with the building envelope. So in order to comply with the total building performance path, um, a whole building energy model will need to be developed by an energy model professional. Once constructed, the building thermal envelope must be tested to verify the overall air leakage does not exceed the specified rate. The purpose of evaluating the air leakage rate of the thermal envelope is to ensure that energy efficiency established within the whole building energy model will not be diminished by a leaky building envelope. The main criticism of the total building performance path is that a whole building energy model allows the energy efficiency of a building project to be much more dependent on the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, so the HVAC systems, rather than depending on the building envelope performed to the minimum standards set forth in the prescriptive path. Most buildings that pursue the total building performance path can comply with the current energy codes while having an overall UA much greater than that established by the allowable UA in the prescriptive path. So naturally, the argument can be made that there is a substantial opportunity to further improve the sustainable performance of buildings through demanding the building envelope meet current acceptable prescriptive requirements in addition to overall building thermal envelope leakage rates. Um, it is important to know that some adaptations of the IECC and ASHRAE standard 90.1 are reducing that loophole created by the total building performance path for energy code compliance. Uh, one of those is here in Washington. Um, the 2018 Washington State Energy Code requires building envelopes to have an overall UA not greater than 20% of the allowable UA per the prescriptive compliance path. So basically, in a way, what the codes are moving towards is basically requiring um, a version of the component performance alternative prescriptive path along with the total building performance path to kind of um, circumvent that loophole that is being created. This right here is an example um, of the IECC climate zones. Um, these are, of course, important for your project determining what your climate zone is, because that is going to determine your approach and your performance requirements that you need to meet. ASHRAE has a climate zone map as well. It is slightly different. So, of course, you know, make sure you're referencing the appropriate one. Um, so looking further into the building and energy codes, as I was doing my research, um, some of the findings I had was that over the years, there's been such a debate over sustainability within the construction industry due to the possible monetary impacts, more stringent requirements per codes can have on all stakeholders in the process. Um, that as a result, the building and energy codes explored within my research um, have been found to provide a considerable loophole through analyzing the building as a whole and allowing the HVAC system to overcompensate or other parts of the building envelope to overcompensate for underperforming parts of the building envelope. Um, and so it, instead of necessitating the building envelope meet explicit performance levels, building and energy codes provide the minimum performance, which is practical and achievable for constructing new buildings and renovating or restoring existing buildings. But exploration of achievable sustainable design and construction principles, such as the IGCC, I found indicated the current model codes that we currently have set the bar below what is practical for what the industry can actually do. You'll see in this um, in this graph, this is the IECC, this is what they're projecting and kind of showing how for um, several years there, there were very small modifications and now they're looking to um, amp up a little bit more. So uh, after looking at the codes, I started looking at other sustainable design and construction principles, um, just on what are the basics. Lead, uh, Nathan, did you have a question? No. <laughs> um, we, there was a question in the Q and A um, about the impact of air leakage testing. Okay. Um, if it, I, I think it actually came when you were just kind of outlining the codes that, that you were discussing. But uh huh. Um, is that having? 
because that's also required for prescriptive fast buildings locally, correct? It depends on how the um, what the local standard is. What I've found is that it's not always required. Um, what the testing is not always required, but a continuous error barrier is. Um, most most local codes have adapted so that you do um, need to require um, a whole building air leakage test, but not all. So it's not actually a requirement everywhere. Sure, thanks. All right, um, so when looking at sustainable design and construction principles, uh, like I said, LEED was one of my key that I looked at. I looked at BRIAM and some others, um, and so was able to develop some of the um, key sustainable guidelines um, and mostly focusing on kind of what the trends were. What is every different program really kind of looking at and, and um, highlighting as a key aspect? So uh, LEED, which um, is the most widely used green building rating system in the world, um, according to the US Green Building Council, LEED is an extremely useful tool for any building type which can provide economic benefits, health benefits, and environmental benefits through providing guidance on implementing sustainable design and construction principles. Sustainable design principles are guidelines developed to assist building owners, designers, engineers, and consultants to not only meet energy code requirements, but exceed current model code requirements. There are different approaches which can be taken to implement green building measures into a building envelope and facade design. The positive about the main different approaches, however, is that there are common threads which can be weaved together to create the basis of an overarching set of sustainable design principles. Ultimately, even though climatic parameters affect the design and the energy use of the buildings, the principles of energy efficiency can be applied in the same way in different climates while adjusting the detail implementation to suit the climate. So the basic framework of the LEED program is for a design and construction team to meet specified criteria according to the project building type. The value of a project uh, building project team attempting to become LEED certified is that the rating system guidebooks offer a set of sustainable design and construction principles, which are clearly laid out. In many ways, the LEED program can be considered similar to a paint by numbers process, relatively simple to follow. Additionally, the LEED rating systems take a holistic approach to green buildings, emphasizing the importance of relationship to the community, both inside the structure and outside the site perimeter. The single most significant credit I found within the core and shell rating system or within LEED in general um, is the enhanced commissioning credit. Building envelope commissioning is a proven process that helps maximize the chances of getting the envelope right. Enhanced commissioning for the building envelope involves a third party building envelope professional assisting in the development of the owner's project requirements document and the basis of design documents through making recommendations for improving thermal performance standards above energy code minimums, as well as recommendations for testing the building envelope assemblies to ensure quality installation. Enhanced building envelope commissioning also involves reviewing the design documents to confirm the design will meet the desired performance targets. Finally, one of the highly impactful aspects of enhanced building envelope commissioning is the involvement of the same 30 party third party professional on the construction site conducting inspections of the building envelope installations. This acts as a safeguard to help uh, verify the building envelope was installed at a quality level, which will limit the deficiencies which lead to facade failures. So here are some additional sustainable guidelines that um, throughout my research for both um, design principles and construction principles. Um, as we were kind of just discussing, an airtight building is an important factor for all green buildings in all climate zones. Um, buildings which are located in colder climates can reduce the heating demand, while buildings in warmer climates can reduce the cooling demand um, through the application of a weather resistive barrier, which increases building airtightness. Secondly, insulation is one of the most important elements to include within the design of an opaque green screen facade assembly. Not only does insulation aid in the prevention of cold transfer indoors from the outside in cold climates, but vice versa is also beneficial in hotter climates. Proper insulation placement within a wall assembly with proper R value can also reduce the formation of condensation within the interior of the building. 
Together with the weather resistive barrier, insulation can provide a significant reduction in energy use for a building and um, improvement in occupant comfort. A good level of solar protection is essential to green buildings as well. The aim here is to afford the building sufficient solar protection so as to keep both cooling energy requirements and expected cooling load, lo load as low as possible. Um, as defined within the IGCC, the amount and location of solar protection is dependent on the orientation of the building, the elevation which glazing systems are located, and the type and extent of fenestration. Although traditionally solar protection is provided through adaptations to the fenetration systems, some rain screen, rain screen assemblies are now being adapted to perform both as the solar protection and as the opaque facade wall. A significant element of the lead rating system is the ethical sourcing of materials. Um, and we found, and I, in my research, I found that choosing the suitable materials during the design of green buildings and sustainable rain screen wall assemblies is only the initial step. Um, the more important aspect of ethically sourcing materials is ensuring those materials are being utilized within the construction of the facade. During the contractor onboarding process and throughout the construction administration process, al alternative materials are submitted for review by the project team as substitutions. Sometimes these substituted products provide similar characteristics but are not as environmentally friendly. In response, the construction management team must take care in reviewing all products being used to execute the building. Confirmation of all materials, not only the environmental affability, should also be conducted. Laboratory tests for all materials used within the facade are recommended to ensure they will perform to the requirements laid out by the owner's requirements, building design, and contract documents. One of the most important sustainable construction principles is the utilization of facade construction mock-ups. Typically, a building project will include a visual mock-up to verify the aesthetic intent for the facade um, and make sure that is being accomplished. Another mock-up is conducted to test the performance of the glazing system. So the PMU um, will meet and make sure that that will meet the project specific performance requirements. But what we're finding is they're both helpful, but the most important mock-up really is um, one which should be used to execute um, the construction interface installation. So basically using a mock-up to go through the process of actually installing what would be going on the building and then testing that, that mock-up itself. Um, so basically it provides a practice run um, such as mock-ups of the interface details are paramount in the proper execution of the facade as they offer lessons learned, which can be documented and aid in preventing errors later during construction. Um, any project that I've had that has used some sort of like practice run type mock-up, um, has also been a really great training tool for any of the trades who are act and or any of the people who are actually out in the field doing the installation. Finally, the fourth imperative sustainable construction principle is executing field tests on the facade to confirm the quality of the installation. Field tests should be performed at set intervals of completion, such as 10%, 30%, 50%, 70%, and 90%, as required by the model energy codes and standards. Once the building envelope is completed, a whole building air leakage test should then be performed. Together, the field tests offer verification the building envelope was well implemented and should offer peace of mind to the project team that the desired green building goals have been achieved. Hey, Patricia. Of course. Um, I'm not sure I understand the difference between the practice mock-up and a traditional performance mock-up. So um, when we're often when we talk about a performance mock-up, especially with a lot of the projects, um, a lot of the larger product projects that are glazing, um, we're using, you know, we have a lot of projects, large projects that are, you know, 80% glazing, 40% glazing, 50% glazing. Um, so usually when you have a performance mock-up, a PMU on the project, it's often um, just that glazing in a laboratory um, being tested. And so it's just that system specifically and is not addressing how that system then interfaces with um, other different aspects of the project. Um, there are performance mockups, um, which I'm sure you're kind of referencing to, where it 
does have kind of what I'm talking about that um, sort of practice run. So it's actually like a form of um, different as different materials and different parts of the building being put together and then tested. But um, through my research and just through my experience, I found that those are a lot more rare um, to actually be done than doing like a visual mock-up and then the separate like curtain wall performance mock-up. And you can't really substitute one for the other to no. kind of reduce those costs. You're kind of you're at three mock-ups now. Exactly. And that's why I found often um, it doesn't happen is because of that kind of VE. So what I've started doing is trying to recommend using that um, visual mock-up as sort of that practice run. So you're kind of combining those two together um, because visual mock-ups tend to have more of the different materials and the different as wall assemblies um, being included, then that kind of helps with that, the, the issue with that is that visual mockups are usually much earlier on than when, you know, all of the sequencing and the construction and all the contractors are involved. You might not have the right extrusions and all that. Exactly. Yep. All right, so after I went through and I looked at all of the um, sort of different model codes and was looking at sustainable design and construction principles, I started looking at facade failure. So what is a facade failure? Um, and, you know, what is um, be a facade failure can per design or per implementation? So in my research, I um, developed this list of key facade failure modes. There are plenty of other different facade failure modes. It also is a uh, perspective of um, kind of who you're talking to. Um, some people will say, you know, a little bit of water penetration through a wall may not be <laughs> a facade failure or a little bit of um, condensation may not be. For some, they will be looking at it as more of a catastrophic type failures. Um, so, you know, structure issues, things falling off the building, stuff like that. Um, I decided to take it more as sort of anything that does not meet the intent, the design intent, um, and the performance intent is a failure mode. And then after taking that, obviously, that's a, a very large amount of failures that are possible. I went through and looked at what are some of the main major ones that occur that um, really can impact the performance and um, impact their performance in regard to sustainability. So the uh, main modes of facade failures I identified through my research are inability to meet expected performance requirements of all forms, like I said, incomplete design or insufficient design, issues due to poor communication of design as the appropriate parties involved were not provided adequate clarification of all necessary building requirements and facade assembly goals, improper construction methods, inadequate quality control and assurance me measures, interface inadequacies due to both design and workmanship deficiencies, moisture issues from the forming of condensation within the interior of the facade wall assembly, moisture issues due to the pooling of water or lack of proper drainage, water penetration, past any element which is intended to stop water mi migration through the facade, material defects due to improper fabrication or manufacturing, durability issues due to incompatible materials, and de deterioration issues due to facade materials deteriorating at different rates or quicker than anticipated. So once I did all of my um, research and basically a literature review is what we call it, um, looking at all of the different codes, the facade failures and everything like that, then I went to the firsthand um, research and I did a photographic analysis of a sustainable project. So the uh, next phase in my research was to observe and analyze the impact of sustainable principles on the installation of rain screen facade assemblies. This objective was, to deter was determined to be accomplished through a photographic study of facade assemblies being installed as part of a sustainable building project. The goal of this study was to note the type and extent of deficiencies observed during a designated period of time. 
In the end, the ultimate aim of my study was to provide data which can be analyzed to conclude the impact sustainability design and construction principles can have on the installation methods used to implement facade systems. The chosen green building project that I um, went and observed is a high rise residential building with a two story retail center at the ground level located in a dense urban environment. The facade of the project is comprised of a brick veneer rain screen system with thermally broken punched uh, window openings. The brick veneer rain screen system was assembled using from the exterior to the interior, a brick veneer, um, a one inch air cavity, two inches of continuous exterior insulation, a fluid applied weather resisted barrier, CMU block or cast in place concrete, stud wall with cavity insulation, vapor retarder, and then the interior finishes. The sustainable design and construction principles utilized for the project followed a local energy code, which is adapted from the ASHRAE standard 90.1. The project also took advantage of a local green building incentive, which allows new building projects to be constructed with additional floors above that which the current zoning permits if the facade weighted U factor is not greater than 80% of the allowable energy code U factor. In addition to meeting the above, a whole building energy model along with hydrothermal studies were completed to ensure the overall building envelope met the energy efficiency targets and condensation risk was properly assessed. Finally, a focus was placed on using ethically sourced materials, which all were required to be laboratory tested and labeled appropriately. So I, did my research for several, several weeks. In my presentation, I've only included four of those weeks, um, but that is what the next part is. So on my first week that I went out there, basically I went on site and I was taking pictures of um, basically the installation of what was happening um, for the rain screen system. While I was out there, I also had some conversations with the design team, the construction team, um, kind of everyone involved, um, the people who are actually doing the installation. Um, and those, those conversations were all sort of informal, um, but were giving me a good idea of kind of what was going on um, and just some feedback about the project. So for the first week that I was out there, um, these are the findings that I found. So I found there are multiple locations where the exterior insulation was noted to have gaps between installed pieces. You can see those all through in here, um, lots of gaps between the different pieces of insula insulation. Um, the observation was made at various window rough openings that the insulation was encroaching in the air cavity. So like I mentioned, when I talked about the assembly of this wall, there's a brick veneer, and then there is supposed to be a one inch air cavity through here and then the insulation. But we often found that there was either dirt or the insulation was then encroaching on that air cavity and making it so the air cavity was no longer um, existent. Uh, there were areas observed where the weather resisted barrier was noted to be discontinuous. Um, and uh, observed that there may be some issues in coming back and tying it back into existing installations of the weather barrier to make it continuous. Um, and then the installation sequence of all the interfaces at the brick support system appeared to differ depending on the location. Um, so I found that how this was coming together, the different layers of the um, the weather barrier and then your through wall flashing and everything as that was coming together was installed differently in different locations on the site. So in week two, um, there were areas where the brick support system was installed inconsistently, as well as areas which suggested the sequence of installation may possibly be an issue in providing a continuous weather resisted barrier. So similar to as what I mentioned in the previous week, um, there may possibly be issues in coming back and tying in that weather barrier um, to create a continuous um, installation found that in this um, picture up here, there were construction tolerances, which were leading to imperfections in the cast in place backup wall. 
um, these imperfections. Um, we're providing ledges, as you can kind of see all through in here. We're providing ledges and areas which could allow water to pool, um, which can lead to moisture issues down the road. The mortar between bricks was noted to be incomplete in many locations. Um, these areas allow for water to pool and easily penetrate through uh, the brick cladding into the facade assembly. Um, so is, if our air cavity is not there to be able to allow it to dry out um, or allow to drain, then that can cause issues as well. And then this again is back to the installation of the weather barrier. You can kind of see um, the layering is inconsistent and I apologize, the, um, the picture is a, probably a little small on your screens, but um, up in this area and there are some other areas, there's little holes um, throughout the weather barrier. So showing that there's some improper application. In week three, um, we found that there was a different, uh, or I found there was a different fluid applied weather resistive barrier that was installed in certain areas. Um, so just making sure there's some compatibility um, that there prior to application um, and is part of my conversations on site. Um, we found that compatibility was not confirmed prior to application. Um, and then again, more gaps between the install of insulation, so making it so it was discontinuous. Um, many window sills were noted to be full of debris. Um, the insulation was completely uh, negating our air cavity. Um, and then we found, or I found that there were also observed beet bricks that had been cut. Um, and although that can be done on site, have to make sure that we're not having um, places for water to sit and pool um, and can cause issues later, especially with a condition similar to this. You can get water pool in there, get in behind the sealant, and then depending on your assembly, possibly make its way into the building. And then week four, um, there's a lot of similar ideas. Um, below several window sills, insulation was not installed up to the rough opening. So there was, um, as you can kind of see in here, there's sort of a strip of area at the window sill which did not have um, insulation. So that is going to present locations for possible thermal bridging um, and can impact your overall wall thermal performance. Gaps were noted between pieces of insulation again. Um, holes were noted within the fluid applied weather resistive barrier. Um, so the presence of these different holes and these ones down here especially, um, it can impact the air leakage rate of the building envelope. And typically those holes are noting that the condition of the wall was actually too wet. Um, and so can um, cause issues if you're trapping moisture um, and also can impact the performance of that uh, weather resistant barrier. And um, as previously noted, as I was saying, um, the insulation was encroaching on that air cavity quite a bit as well. So after I completed um, my several visits to the site, um, documented my data, some of the um, findings I found, um, my facade failure modes were identified due to the steady observation of nonconformances centered around discontinuity of the weather resistant barrier, discontinuity of the exterior insulation, absence of the air cavity, and inconsistent installation of interface details. All of these primary observations have the possibility to be rectified through adequate quality control and, assur and assurance measures. Nevertheless, these deficiencies indicate a variance in the Im implementation of the rain screen facade assembly from the aspirational sust sustainable design. As you all know, the design of the system was meant to be continuous. It was meant to be, you know, on paper, we're looking at an, a wall assembly and, you know, we have all of the different layers and they're, you know, laid out perfectly. In the field, we're finding on this project, at least what I found was that it was extremely inconsistent um, and it was not, you know, matching what we had documented on paper. 
Um, the discontinuity of the exterior insulation indicated poor communication of the design intent to provide an uninterrupted thermal barrier around the building envelope while also raising the concern the actual thermal performance of the building may not meet the sustainable requirement to have a facade weighted U factor no greater than 80% of the allowable energy code U factor. The absence of the air cavity was noted due to the possibility of diminished airflow within the brick veneer rain, rain screen system, impacting the expected performance of the facade. The congested air cavity can also allow for water to pool without the capability of draining to the exterior, which is a requirement per code. Such water collection can have an impact on the durability of the surrounding materials. The inconsistency in the installation of the interface details suggested a possibility of poor communication of the design, improper coordination of the installation sequencing, and construction methods to be utilized. This observation um, of nonconformance also indicated a need for improved quality control and assurance measures um, to ensure facade deficiencies were diminished. Construction schedules can be immensely impacted by weather conditions as most facade materials have weather related installation restrictions. As the weather conditions had an impact on the installation process, the construction methods used needed to be adjusted. Education and trainings on all the various methods and communication as to the appropriate method to be used on any given day is crucial. Each of the above findings emphasize the complexity of designing and implementing building facades, but also suggests the inclusion of green building targets can increase the possibility for facade nonconformances and deficiencies due to the more stringent demands placed on the execution of the facade design. So like I mentioned, as I was on site, um, I had a lot of informal conversations speaking with the design team, the general contractor team, the subcontractors, the people actually installing the facade. Um, and there were some very interesting things that I found in speaking with them. Um, so in th throughout that study, I found that not all members of the design and construction team were literate in the specific requirements of the local green building incentive, which was being pursued by the project. So the incentive that I was speaking of where if they met 80% uh, of the UA, then they could have a taller building. The design team relied heavily on the facade consultant to ensure the project was designed and then constructed to meet the green rain screen facade aspirations. So it was a situation where the design and construction team were heavily relying on the consultant without actually taking the time to educate themselves on what the requirements were and why the consultant may be saying certain things are, are important or not. Not all the members of the construction team understood the impact of the deficiencies in the implementation of the rain screen fa facade assembly. Again, the construction team relied heavily on the facade consultant to ensure the project was being implemented to the standards required to meet the green rain screen facade aspirations. Part of the conversations that I had with some of the people who were actually doing the installation a lot of it, they were saying that they were doing certain things or fixing certain things purely because the facade consultant was telling them that they had to, but often found that they didn't understand why that was important. And so finding that educating them on why it was important um, helped kind of improve their attitude as to why they were doing certain things or why they couldn't cut certain corners or things like that. Um, not all laborers were explained the reasoning behind recommended corrections and action items brought forth by the facade consultant, as I just said. Um, as a result, some corrections were more difficult to execute due to purely the lack of understanding of the end goal. Um, and then the facade consultant, on top of all of this, was limited in authority to enforce recommendations made to better implement the rain screen facade assembly. So there was a lot of evidence of the design and construction team relying on the facade consultant who actually had limited authority in making any changes or making any impacts on the actual implementation. So in conclusion, 
Um, as stated previously, building and energy codes along with green building rating systems such as LEED provide an emphasis on buildings as a whole, which allows HVAC systems to compensate for underperforming building envelopes. This loophole is beginning to be addressed in some energy code adaptations like the state of Washington, um, but it has yet to be adapted by the model codes. This is one advancement which could help to improve the sustainable design and implementation of rain screens. And in all research and in all um, scuttlebutt, if you will, um, that is going on right now, it sounds like the next model code additions are going to start implementing a lot of these types of things. Um, so it will start coming. Another aspect underscored within the research was the increased recommendations for building envelope commissioning and special inspections. The main concern with this is that they are still recommendations rather than requirements. The industry has demonstrated that unless required, additional costs for items such as building envelope commissioning will not be included in project budget typically. Finally, the most important theme throughout the research study was the lack of education and training which exists in the industry. Based on the information established, established in my research, sustainable design and construction principles would benefit most from education and training programs from, for the facade industry at large. So not just the design professionals, but also for your construction teams and you know, everyone who is participating um, in the process. Through my research, um, I did kind of uncover this idea that I hadn't really thought about before as a facade professional, um, is that there is a great importance for green building envelope designs to assist in alleviating the impact buildings have on the global climate crisis. So in some ways, sustainable design and construction principles have intensified the possibility of facade deficiencies. And this is due to the increased expectations of facades and continued resistance of, to share knowledge um, and to collaborate on you know, facade failures and what was going on, how to improve. Um, and so I found that it's become explicitly clear that there are areas where sustainable design and construction principles can decrease the rate of deficient facade deficiencies, um, especially in rain screen facades, um, but we'll never be able to get rid of facade failures and eliminate them entirely. Um, but we definitely, a big part of um, the process is improving our model codes and then improving our, our knowledge sharing and our education throughout at all levels of the process. And thank you, that is it. <laughs> Great, thanks Patricia. A um, couple more questions. The Cliff asks, if the mineral insulation is not the most stable material, how do you suggest it be stabilized or made more rigid so it doesn't deform and delaminate when placed inside the cavity? Um, it looked like that was on pins. Yes, so there was a few things um, that I do know that the team had discussed. Um, I don't know what exactly what ended up being implemented at the time, um, but um, when they do pins, there is actually a pin cover that goes on it. So it helps um, to actually hold the insulation in place. And we found that, or I found that the shop drawings included that, but the install in the field did not. And so that is one thing that was discussed about the possibility of using that. Um, a big part of what we um, what was found on this this site was the way that they were um, cutting the insulation and the tools that they were using actually was making it so the insulation the mineral was breaking apart more. And so then they were installing pieces of insulation that were already kind of broken down and not necessarily holding together very well. Um, and so then you put it into the wall where they're hiding brick and there's mortar and everything kind of going with it that it just kind of increased that issue. Um, so I would say, I mean, the product itself is improving. Like this is um, something that they're continuing to improve. There are options out there that have um, mineral wool that has a uh, sort of a black um, coating on the exterior face that was developed more for open joint rain screen systems. So instead of having to do a water shedding barrier on the face of the insulation, 
um, that it's kind of like a pre-applied basically. Um, so that way you have something that's UV stable. And when you look through an open joint in a rain screen, it's hitting, you see that black versus, um, you know, seeing the insulation or something like that. Um, and we found that that it's more expensive. It's not very widely used yet, um, but have found that that tends to hold together a little bit more um, because of that coating that's on the exterior face. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you're using stick pins to install the mineral wool, you know, if you're having issues with the install, looking at the possibility of using um, the covers or, you know, other options like that to actually hold the insulation in place. Yeah, it seems without pin covers, it would it could just fall off in the wall later. Yeah, yeah. Um, in one of the previous slides, there was a brown material over the insulation board. I think it was here, but I don't know which area Cliff is talking about. <laughs> um, so these, like your green arrow arrows, are all pointing to the insulation. Mm -hmm. First slide? Yeah, this is the first. This would be the first yeah. slide. Yeah. So you've got your fluid applied. The blue material is a self adhered. Yep. So the blue applied is a self adhered that's wrapping the um, opening. And then you've got your insulation, which is the brown material. Um, the gray material is your weather resisted barrier. Um, your yellow is your through wall flashing. And then down here is your um, shelf angle for the brick. Um, I also had a question earlier about um, how do you convince the owner to pay for a comprehensive integrated mock-up? Is there, are there tools for that? Are there standards? Um... That, and that's part of the, I guess, part of the issue is that um, there's not necessarily um, like a standard kind of for that. A big part of it, though, um, what typically you'll see is more of in specifications, they have those what we call initial mock up or initial install mock up. So that is obviously something that's in place install. Um, so if we can't get you know, a comprehensive mock-up, um, as I would recommend. Um, I found that I then try to push for those initial installation mock-ups to be as comprehensive as they can for whatever that material is, um, or whatever that section of the building is that's being installed in place. Um, so making sure, you know, the very first section of whatever that wall assembly is that's being installed, um, you know, you have it installed with as many interfaces as possible, and then you have your, you know, quality control team out there looking at it, talking about it, your design team looking at it, making sure it meets the aesthetic, um, make sure it meets the performance, kind of highlight any of those issues for that initial install um, to make sure you're setting the standards then for the rest of the install as it goes. But as for getting the money and convincing the owner, I mean, the main thing is you're you're offering a quality control measure. You know, you're offering something for them to, you know, extend the possibility and improve the possibility of a good install of the building in general. Um, Cliff also asked, should the comprehensive mock-up be tested in the laboratory? I think that's kind of uh, different. Yeah, so that's kind of different setup. Um, usually when, I, when I'm talking like the comprehensive, there's so many different materials and so many different like lab testing. Um, that's not usually possible, but you can do um, different field tests for it mm -hmm. um, to, you know, make sure all of your interfaces and everything are um, working appropriately. Um, one thing that I've only gotten to do it on like one project, but I did a comprehensive and we, it was a several day adventure um, of, you know, we made sure we had the weather, weather resisted barrier installed. We tested that, um, especially with rain screen systems, you know, that's usually your main um, kind of main thing protecting the building. 
So we were able to test that and then they installed the rain screen system and um, finished installing kind of the rest of it with the coping and the flashing and everything. And then we tested it again um, and just did um, like water testing, spray hose water testing for a lot of that. Um, but it allowed us to kind of make sure that we we're setting the standards for how that weather resisted barrier was installed and then how all of the different parts and pieces that go on top of it were installed. Um, have you done that with an in-place mock-up or is it usually a freestanding? It was a freestanding, um, a freestanding mock-up. It was a, a pretty big project. Um, so the, the owners were definitely looking to spend the extra money to make sure their quality control was going into this, um, you know, very expensive building that they were putting together. And so you're testing to, to field pressures mm -hmm. when you're doing those in the field? Mm-hmm. Or doing like bubbles or 502s or um, a combination of that? Yeah, it was it was kind of a combination. So we did um, the um, kind of your typical like window testing. So the E, I always forget the numbers, E11, O, whatever. Um, so like the actual like chamber testing for the windows and for like the glazing part. Um, and then we um, did, yeah, some AMA, uh, spray the spray hose testing of different areas and there was of course some like pull testing there was like thickness testing you know they kind of went through all the different sort of levels that you would do normally on an install of um like just you know quality checks that you would do in the field yeah um any other folks with questions? I think the, so you have, you did one sample, this building that we're looking at here, basically. One sample that I included within my research, um, uh -huh. within my actual dissertation, um, I, had looked at um, a couple other buildings as a part of my research, but I just didn't include it in my, um, like my formal dissertation. Yeah, it's a hard thing to sample. Yeah, yeah. There, Cliff says there's an AMA rain screen test. So um, right now there's um, just voluntary tests. So you have your AMA 508, your AMA 509, um, and those are um, specific for the rain screen um, like panel system themselves. So you, often you'll find that those are completed by the um, manufacturer, the fabricator of those systems. So there is that test, which I absolutely recommend including in all of your specifications, um, depending on what you want with the 508 or the 509. So whether it's a pressure equalized or a back ventilated rain screen system. So depending on the performance you're going for, um, I do absolutely recommend having those included in your specs um, and having that as a performance requirement to have a system that is tested, um, but it's not something that would be done like in the field. Hmm. And that's a full system, um, like sheathing out kind of test? Um, so it's the system is testing the um, rain screen system itself. So usually it's, um, they'll set it up on a chamber. And so they're usually the chamber has like plexiglass that acts as the gyp, um, and, but it, so it's not actually your exterior sheathing. Um, and then, but it'll install like the rails and the, have the open or have the cavity um, and, you know, all the requirements that are for that, that actual rain screen um, assembly itself or rain screen um, product itself. It's kind of different from like a, a uh, NFPA 285, where you have to have a specific, like all of the pieces have to be there. Right, exactly. Yep. The NFPA 285 is the full assembly. Um, and so you 
can't substitute other materials. It has to be exactly what was installed for that test, whereas the AMA 508, 509, or for just the like cladding rain screen assembly, it doesn't, um, you know, care about the insulation or the weather barrier or anything like that. All right, good. Well, uh, Patricia, thank you very much for your time. Um, we are looking forward to getting back in person with folks in September, um, but also intend to maintain a hybrid um, system. So we will continue to broadcast meetings over um, Zoom. Um, I think the last announcement that I have is that uh, we do have our symposium scheduled for next May. Um, we are looking forward to putting all that together and getting back with folks at the art museum again. Um, if you're interested in helping out with the symposium, um, that's a great way to, to help out with CBEC. Um, we put together kind of a subcommittee to, to manage that. So please reach out if you're interested in helping out. Uh, thanks everybody for your time. Thanks again, Patricia, and uh, you guys have a great evening.